Hello. In this unit I want to talk about some specific aqueous chemistry of the actinide elements. Actually, I mean some specific aqueous chemistry of the early actinides, but more than that, some specific aqueous chemistry of the actinides that can exist in 5 plus and 6 plus oxidation states. And so this is chemistry that is prevalent in uranium, neptunium, plutonium and americium. What we observe for actinide ions when we dissolve them in water, like transition metal ions, depends upon the oxidation state. When the oxidation state is relatively low, the aqueous species are simply hydrated cations. But when the oxidation numbers are high, the chemistry becomes more complicated and we see complex molecular ions. Let's have a look at uranium as an example. Uranium, like other f-block elements, is very electropositive. It reacts with water, giving up electrons and reducing it to form hydrogen gas. Even the putative uranium-2 plus cation does this, and so does not exist in water. By the time we get to uranium-3 plus, although a strong reducing agent, it can exist in water and forms sympydrates. A structurally similar situation exists for the smaller uranium-4 plus ion. But when we oxidize uranium to a 5 plus state, we never ever see a free uranium 5 plus cation. Instead, we always see a complex UO2 species, which is also prevalent when uranium is in the 6 plus oxidation state. The same chemistry is also observed for the neighboring actinides. We collectively call the actinide O2 plus and the actinide O2 2 plus cations actinyl ions and these include the uranyl, the neptunyl, the plutonyl and the americyl ions. We do need to be a bit careful here and we may need to specify which metal and the oxidation state or the ion charge just to be clear about which species we're referring to. Structurally all actinyl ions have a linear arrangement of the three atoms. It is useful to think of the oxygen atoms as forming an axial part of the metal coordination environment and it makes sense to define this as a z-axis. The metal oxygen distances are very very short, while the bonds to equatorial ligands are much longer. The formation of these actinyl ions dominates the chemistry of these elements when in the plus 5 or the plus 6 oxidation states. So for example, looking at uranium compounds, of which there are hundreds and hundreds, you have to work very hard to avoid forming the uranyl ion. Whether we are talking about discrete molecular species in solution, charged or neutral, or if we have a solid state structure, the uranyl ion is everywhere. So while the linear OUO part is constant, we find that the coordination number in the equatorial plane can range from 3 to 6, depending on the nature of the ligands. So for example, a large bulky ligand with a single point of attachment can give us a trigonal bipyramidal geometry to the central uranium ion. With smaller ligands, it's sterically possible to fit more things in the equatorial plane. Look, we can get four chloride ions in the plane around the uranium. You should contrast that with the first row of the transition metals, the 3D elements. In those cases, four coordinated chloride ions arrange themselves in a tetrahedral geometry. This is a reflection of the much larger size of the 5F atoms compared to the atoms of the 3D elements. The highest coordination number achieved for uranyl ions is with small ligands that are able to bind by a chelating bidentate mode. Look, I've got carbonate and nitrate in this last group, enabling a hexagonal bipyramidal geometry at the metal. So the coordination complexes have characteristic structures. But what else can we say about the bonding? First up, those axial oxygen atoms are very hard to exchange. When we measure the rate of ligand exchange in aqueous solution, which we can do by isotopic studies, we find that the rate of reaction is very slow. In fact, instead of a rate, I'll give you a half-life of the unreacted actinyl unit. About half of it will have reacted after 10 to the power 9 seconds. You know, this is one of those times when SI units are not always that helpful. That's about 40 years. This is a very, very slow reaction. 
What about the other ligands, these equatorial auxiliary ligands? They can be exchanged really quickly. And I say really quickly, I mean at the same sorts of rates seen for other simple dications. Think calcium. So synthetically it's easy to exchange one set of ligands for another. As well as thinking about the rate, it's also useful to look at the stability constants. This is defined as the ratio of the amount of product divided by the mathematical product of the amount of starting materials when the reaction has reached equilibrium. If K is bigger than 1, then the reaction proceeds in the forward direction. Smaller than 1, and the reverse reaction occurs. Usually we look at the log of K, because the values of K itself vary by so much. So if the log of K is greater than 0, the forward reaction occurs. If the log of K is negative, then the reverse reaction occurs. Let's compare the stability constants for thorium 4 plus and the uranyl ion UO2 2 plus. OK, let's start by just looking at thorium. Adding the fluoride ion, a small hard anionic Lewis base, it clearly displaces water easily. The chloride ion is a much softer Lewis base than the fluoride ion. It still displaces water, but only just. The bromide ion is softer still, and now it is displaced by water. All this suggests, as you might expect, that thorium 4 plus is a hard Lewis acid and likes to coordinate with hard Lewis bases. Now let's look at the same stability constants for the uranyl ion. Fluoride. It's a large positive number. But compared to thorium 4 plus, the stability constant is much less. In fact, it's about a thousand times smaller. Well, the uranyl ion has fewer sites to coordinate to, and much more importantly, a much smaller cationic charge. Both the chloride and the bromide ions do not displace water. Again, the uranyl cation is a hard Lewis acid. Now, EDTA. That's ethylene diamine tetraacetate. That's the chelating hexadentate ligand that is perfect for encapsulating a D block sized cation. For thorium, the stability constant is huge. Compare this with the coordination to the uranyl group. OK, it's still a large number, but look, it's 10 to the power 18 times smaller. To a large extent, that is because of the shape of the uranyl ion. It can only accept coordination in the equatorial plane. An EDTA is not so good at that. It's much better at, at encapsulating a cation. So what have we got? The axial oxygen in the axonal ions are strongly bound and inert to reaction or substitution, while the equatorial ligands behave much more like the coordination of ligands in the lanthanide ions. They are easily and rapidly exchanged. This suggests two things. The bonding within the actinyl group is covalent, while the bonding of the equatorial ligands is principally ionic or electrostatic. If we want to understand the bonding within the actinyl group, we need to consider the overlap of atomic orbitals and the molecular orbital energy level diagram. So here's a recap. We need to remember what f orbitals look like. Because the actinide is not in a cubic symmetry environment, and especially because there is one unique axis, it makes sense to use the general set of f orbitals as our basis set. Green and yellow show different phases of the wave function. We don't need to fully understand all of the details of the shapes of each wave function. What is important here is to consider the oxygen actinide oxygen axis, or as we have defined it, the z axis, in terms of bonding. It is the shape or symmetry of these orbitals when viewed along the z-axis that will tell us about the character of the bonding molecular orbitals. So the fz cubed orbital has cylindrical symmetry. End on, it can form a sigma bond. The fxz squared orbital and the fyz squared orbital have the symmetry of p orbitals when viewed along the z-axis. These will be capable of forming pi bonds. The f x y z and the f z times x squared minus y squared look like the d x y and the d x squared minus y squared when viewed along the z axis. Potentially, 
these could form delta bonds. So we've refreshed our memory on the shape of the F orbitals. Let's have a go at constructing a molecular orbital diagram. On the metal we've got a set of seven 5F orbitals and higher up in energy there are a set of five 6D orbitals. On the oxygen atoms each one has three P orbitals a PX, a PY and a PZ. We can look at the shapes of these orbitals and form linear combinations of the atomic orbitals in order to generate molecular orbitals. OK, there are a lot of atomic orbitals here and so there are a lot of molecular orbitals. Don't panic. Before we get into the details, remember the lower energy orbitals tend to be bonding while the higher energy ones tend to be anti-bonding. In fact, it's just these six lowest orbitals that are bonding molecular orbitals. So look, just looking at the lowest energy molecular orbitals, at the bottom is a set of two degenerate pi orbitals. These are ungarad, so we label them as pi subscript u. This is how they are constructed and what they look like. Two px orbitals on each of the oxygen atoms are added to the f x z squared orbital on the metal. I've not shown it but the degenerate orthogonal orbital is obtained by rotating this image 90 degrees about the z-axis and that is constructed from two py orbitals on the oxygen atoms and from the f y z squared orbital on the metal. Notice how these molecular orbitals span three atoms and notice that the pi shape when viewed along the z-axis. Next is another pair of degenerate pi orbitals. These are Garrard, so labelled pi subscript g. One is composed of a linear combination of the oxygen p orbital, px orbitals and the dxz orbital, while the other, not shown, is formed from the py oxygen orbitals and the dyz orbital on the metal. This is the same shape as the pi g orbital that I have shown but rotated 90 degrees about the z-axis. The next orbital is a sigma subscript g orbital formed from the oxygen pz orbitals and the metal dz squared orbital. And then there is a sigma u orbital formed by the overlap of the oxygen pz orbitals and the fz cubed orbital on the metal. Notice that the orbital overlap is actually more effective for the pi bonds than for the sigma bonds and that the pi orbitals are lower in energy. So that is what the bonding part of our molecular orbital diagram looks like in all actinyl ions. So where do the electrons go? Or the question we should ask before that one is how many electrons are involved in the bonding of these atoms? Well, let's specifically take the case of the uranyl ion UO2 2 plus. That means uranium is in the oxidation state 6 plus, which means that it has lost all of its valence electrons. But if we are treating uranium as being in the 6 plus oxidation state, then each oxygen is formally an O2 minus ion, and so we get an outer 2s2 2p6 configuration. So in each oxygen the p orbitals are full. There are six electrons, 12 electrons in total. Redistributing these 12 electrons to the molecular orbitals, we fill up the pi u, the pi g, the sigma g and the sigma u orbitals. All the bonding molecular orbitals are full. That's the six bonding orbitals distributed over three atoms, essentially making the oxygen atoms triply bonded to the uranium atom. So that was the uranyl ion. We also observe similar chemistry with neptunium and plutonium and americium, although it turns out as we progress along this series there is a general decrease in the stability of this structure. Actually that makes sense. While in uranium all of the bonding molecular orbitals are filled, as we move along the series we are at each step adding one more electron into an anti-bonding molecular orbital. It also accounts for the tendency of the uranium 5 plus uranyl ion UO2 plus to undergo disproportionation. 
giving equal proportions of uranium 4 plus and uranium 6 plus. That's quite a lot about bonding. I should say a couple of words about the characteristic spectroscopic properties of the axonal group and the uranyl group in particular. In the infrared spectrum, the asymmetric stretch of the OUO group is located at about 940 wave numbers. This seemed quite large to me, but I'm used to metal oxygen stretches that are much lower in energy and usually outside the range of most spectrometers. But what I'm not used to is such high bond orders. It's the triple bond which gives us such a high frequency transition here. OK, now look at the electronic transitions. The uranyl group absorbs light at about 425 nanometers. That's blue-green. But the absorption spectrum has a huge amount of complex fine structure. What we're observing is not a pure electronic absorption transition. But additionally, a change in the vibrational state. So from the ultraviolet visible spectrum we can extract the OUO vibrational frequency. OK, absorption in the visible region gives us coloured compounds. In this case, while the uranyl group absorbs in the blue-green part of the spectrum, it fluoresces, emitting light in the green part. This characteristic was widely exploited in the production of coloured glass. This collectible uranium glass from the 1920s and 30s owes its distinctive colour to the uranyl iron. OK, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. And in the next video, we'll look at some organometallic chemistry of the actinide elements.